So if we reject the law, it's the same as rejecting the Son. The rejection of the Son is the same as the rejection of the Father. We are on the very verge of the final conflict, and the world needs to be warned. This movement is not to form separate congregations. This movement is to infuse all. So the world is seeing revolt. Well, who's engineering these events? It's not just happening in the Arab world. It's happening in Europe. It's going to come here. People are fed up with everything that's going on in this world. And this is the breach that needs to be repaired in the time that we live in. We can study prophecies, we can know what's happening in the world, we can see all of these things. If we don't start right here with Jesus, we've gone nowhere. I have titled this lecture, Give Me This Mountain. Deception is a very serious issue. And we want to see behind the scenes what's happening in the world today. There is in our world at the moment an initiative called the Seven Mountains Initiative. In 1975, Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade, and Lauren Cunningham, founder of Youth with a Mission, had lunch together in Colorado and God simultaneously gave each of these change agents a message to give to the other. During that same time frame, Francis Schaeffer was given a similar message. That message was that if we are to impact any nation for Jesus Christ, then we would have to effect the seven spheres or seven mountains of society that are the pillars of any society. And we saw in a previous lecture that organizations such as Campus Crusade were funded by Jesuit funds. The seven mountains, they claim, are business, government, media, arts and entertainment, education, the family, and religion. And if you control all of those, then you have absolute control politically, mentally, spiritually, over every human being on the planet. And uh, there are many subgroups in these main categories. About a month later, the Lord showed Francis Schaeffer, so they claim in their Reclaim Seven Mountains webpage, the same thing. In essence, God was telling these three change agents, now this word change, 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 has been a refrain in many parts of the world. Where the battlefield was, it was here where culture would be won or lost. Their assignments was to raise up change agents to scale the mountains and to help a new generation of change agents understand the larger story. Now, this is a fascinating uh, scenario. Now, the following slides are from the Oz Hillman presentation regarding this kind of theology. And here you have your seven mountains and the quotes and the texts that are used to bring people into this mind frame is now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. So this is an attempt to set up the kingdom. And then they tell the same story as to how it comes about. And uh, the Bible tells us that in the last days there will be sheep and goats, so there will be sheep nations and there will be goat nations. And in order to get them all together, well, you have to change the entire mindset. Another one of his slides, Joshua and the seven enemies. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, pass through the camp and command the people, saying, 
Prepare provisions for yourself, for within three days you will cross over the Jordan and go and possess the land which the Lord your God is given you to possess. Quoting Joshua 1, 10 to 11. So there's this movement to take control for God. And they want to displace the seven enemies, the mountains, to take the promised land. This is how you will know that the living God is amongst you and that he will certainly drive out seven enemies before you, including the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Now they have renamed these seven mountains, but if you take the literal theology of dispensationalism, then these should be literal nations. Now, herein lies the problem. We seem to have more than one theology regarding the setting up of God's kingdom on earth because dispensationalism teaches that a literal Jewish state will once again reign over the heathen nations, but the church will not be involved because it will have been raptured. That's one theology. That is what we call a consumer theology. But there's another theology behind the scenes, which is the Roman Catholic theology, that they will control the entire world. Another slide from the series, but I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. And this is a time for God's people to be raised up in the seven mountains. And the backdrop shows you that if you control each and every one of these, well, then you have control of the world. Another man who used this word change, change over and over was President Obama. He used it in his inauguration speech. He pledged that America's time of protecting narrow interests and putting off unpleasant decisions had surely passed. He noticed how the crisis of 2008 was a consequence of greed and irresponsibility on the part of some combined with a collective failure to make hard choices. And behind the scenes there is a movement towards change, a new system with new rules and new attitudes. And if you do not understand biblical prophecy, you could get duped by this. My question that I have, has peace come? Since Obama has been in office, do we have peace? No, we don't have peace. Has war ended? There's more talk now of war than ever before. Has the financial crisis ended? No. Has the world become a better place? No. Now, if you look at these initiatives, they say our ministry and our goal is to break down the wall of the secular versus the sacred. So what is the real enemy? The real enemy is secularism. We have to break down secularism. We have to break down humanism. This is exactly what the Bible predicted when it says the king of the north shall overrun the king of the south which is religious community, religious thinking, theos, overrunning the secular mindset. To bring revival in the workplace, to help Christians to see their work as their calling and ministry, to engage more Christians in the work of the ministry, to see God's transforming power manifested in the workplace, and to reclaim the seven mountains of culture influence. Now, most of these are not problematic, but here you are claiming complete control in Christian nations as Islamic nations are claiming in their areas. So it is a, a theos. One of the basics are that the family must undergird all cultural mountains. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Now the mountain is always a symbol of a kingdom. So they use this to say that all nations will be subject to this one political entity 
And the Bible says the same. All power shall be given unto the beast. And the kings of the world will give their power unto the beast. And we looked in the previous lectures and we saw that all the reformers throughout the ages referred to the beast power as the Roman Catholic system. So the family forms the basis and we'll see how that fits in with the story, media, education, arts and entertainment, government, business, the church. But the family must be the basis of this full frontal attack. Now here's the address of His Holiness Benedict XVI to the bishops of the United States of America from Region 8 on their Ad Limina visit in March 2012. Yet as blessed John Paul observed, the future of humanity passes by way of the family. So this is the foundation stone. And then he refers to Familiaris Consortio, which is the document which John Paul wrote on the issue. Indeed, the good that the church and society as a whole expect from marriage and from the family founded on marriage is so great as to call for full pastoral commitment to this particular area. Marriage and the family are institutions that must be promoted and defended from every possible misrepresentation of their true nature, since whatever is injurious to them is injurious to society itself. So the family must form the basis. Now how do you get a mindset to follow along this line. Of course, it's true. You want the family there, but how do you get a mindset to come into such a position that it is prepared to legislate theological thinking to control the actions of men? That's something that the American Constitution has forbidden in the past. Church and state should be separate. But if you're going to control all the mountains, including government, then church and state must come together. Here's Zenit magazine, the Roman Catholic paper. Pontiff wants families to start preparing for the 2012 event. And he says the next world meeting of families is not till 2012. That has been and that has come and that has gone. And again, the basic cry was made, we have to ensconce the family. Thus the Pope continued, it is necessary to promote reflection and efforts at reconciling the demands and periods of work with those of the family and to recover the true meaning of the feast, especially on Sunday, the weekly Easter, the day of the Lord and the day of man, the day of the family, of community and solidarity, and we saw that there is this movement to ensconce Sunday as a universal day of rest. Now we know that that is a papal law and not a biblical law. So here is a possibility to get such legislation enacted that morality will be legislated. But whose morality? The Bibles or the beasts? Morning Star Ministries, Morning Star University, releasing a supernatural army to transform the world. Find your destiny, impact history, change the world. We have to go from what we are now to something else. Events, regional impacts, prophetic bulletins, glory CD release. And the people involved, we see them there, are very interesting. Rick Joyner, he's a very, very prominent man in the world today. And he has millions of followers all over the world. And especially young people, even in countries like Germany and all over the world, this theology is gaining adherence at a supersonic speed. Here he is, and this picture is very fascinating. What is he receiving here? He is receiving a special recognition 
of his activities, he is a knight of Malta, which means that he is subject to the Pope and everything he does will be to the glory of the papal kingdom. That's what his aim is. So let's have a look at what he has to say. Rick Joyner of the Oak Initiative and Morning Star Ministries dedicated yesterday's edition of Prophetic Perspectives to distancing himself from dim dominion theology, which is exactly taking dominion of the world. But in actual fact, he doesn't distance himself. He just adds a slant, and I'm interested in that slant. While discussing the ties between presidential candidates like Rick Perry and Michelle Bachmann, they're no, no longer in the run, but that's irrelevant because this movement continues. To avowed dominionists, Joyner said he agreed with much of the dominionist objective of having fundamentalist Christians influence, if not control, government and society at large, but noted that he does not share dominionist belief that such dominion will usher in the end times and the second coming of Christ. I just don't believe his dominion can come to the earth until he comes, Joyner said, and that's the one defining point of a dominionist to me. You see, there are these two theologies in the world. The one that is fed to the people and the one that is the more insider theology. If you can get people excited about the coming kingdom, but you have a literal Jerusalem mindset, well then, dispensationalists believe that something's going to happen over there, while actually something else is happening over here. And uh, why do they believe like this? Well, we have to understand Roman Catholic thinking on the millennium. You see, dispensationalists believe that the millennium will take place here on earth and only the Jews and some heathen nations will be around, the Christians will be gone, and Christ will rule for a thousand years here on earth. But the Bible knows nothing of that. The Bible says when Christ comes, the dead will be raised and those that are alive that are in Christ will be changed and will be changed instantly and together they will meet the Lord in the air and be with him forever. The Bible knows nothing about this two-part event as is being sold to the Christian world today. And Roman Catholics certainly don't believe it. Roman Catholics believe in amillennianism. There is no specific period of a thousand years. The period applies to the whole of church history. This view is the view held by Roman Catholicism and some conservative Protestant groups. So Roman Catholics believe that when the whole world is subject to the papacy, then the rule of the church begins. And that is what they are moving to. And this, of course, is what Rick Joyner believes because he's a knight of Malta. And this is what he is using, but he is using the mass of evangelicalism to further his ends. But in actual fact, these people, whether they be generals in the United States Army, whether they are the heads of the Green Berets, or other positions which they hold, they are Knights of Malta. So their first allegiance is not to their country. Their first allegiance is to the Pope. So the true soldiers of the cross are mobilizing. The church is about to be clothed with a beauty that is beyond this world. Rick Joyner with Judge Street, June 9, 2007. So which church, according to him, will be clothed with beauty? Roman Catholicism. But the reformer said that Roman Catholicism represents Antichrist. But nobody believes that anymore. That will believe in a future Antichrist that will come at some stage and will deal only with the Jews. But Paul says that spirit was already working in his days.
And Jesus said exactly the same thing. He said that it would be with us till the end and it will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. So here is a bit of confusion. This is a behind the scenes theology. Here we have Rick Joyner with General Jerry Boykin, once a Delta Force member and one time head of the Green Berets. Knights of Malta, you'll find that the FBI, as we saw, the CIA, all of these mega organizations were started by Knights of Malta and are controlled by these organizations. And this is what he has to say. This war is a battle for the hearts and minds of people. This is a spiritual war. Don't look for a physical war over there. The battle is for your heart. The battle is for your mind. It is a spiritual war, and the weapons are spiritual, not carnal. You're right on. You know what you're saying, Rick Joyner. This was actually true in the Cold War, too, as a main tenet of communism was to destroy religion. However, the communists declared for 70 years that God was dead, and then God in one day said communism is dead, and it died fast. Some nations have managed to keep it on a form of life support, but it is in fact dead. It was not just Wall Street that tore down the Iron Curtain, but it was the Word of God that brought it down. And we know from history that John Paul II, together with Reagan, took the accolades, but Reagan praised Pope John Paul II for bringing down communism, so-called. About the kingdom, they claim the kingdom of God will not be socialism, but a freedom even greater than anyone on earth knows at this time. Now, they're working for this. This is their mountain. They're going to claim this kingdom. But didn't Jesus say, my kingdom is not of this world? Didn't he say that? So this is an earthly kingdom. This is a counterfeit kingdom. And millions and millions of people are being duped into accepting a counterfeit for the real thing. At first, it may seem totalitarianism. <laughs> As the Lord will destroy the Antichrist spirit now dominating the world with the sword of his mouth and will shatter many nations like pottery. Now, if you understand Roman Catholic theology, then it is a doctrine of reversal. And that which is Antichrist becomes the opposite. And so, woe to them that call good evil and evil good. If you go into occultism, it's also a gospel reversal. Lucifer becomes the light and Christ becomes the darkness. However, fundamental to his rule is 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Instead of taking away liberties and becoming more domineering, the kingdom will move from a point of necessary control, while people are learning truth, integrity, honor, and how to make decisions, to increasing liberty so that they can. So initially, he says, our kingdom will be totalitarianism. Ap Absolute control. You will be forced. But John says, my kingdom is not of this world. And if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews? But now is my kingdom not from hence? So we have two kingdom theologies here. He continues to say the kingdom will start out necessarily authoritative in many ways or in many areas, but it will move towards increasing liberty. These people have an agenda, and they're going to get the agenda, and they will use fear as a means of gaining the agenda. And people with good intentions, really wanting to do the Lord's will, will be duped into doing someone else's will. This is scary. This is scary. 
So do all true churches and movements that are advancing towards the kingdom. So all the churches are to be involved in this. You may have to be very controlling of toddlers, but the older they get, the more they can be trusted and the more freedom they should have if they are going to develop into due maturity, which requires personal responsibility. Excuse me, who's going to be the tutor here and who's going to be the toddler? Seems to me the toddler is everyone who doesn't agree with this particular agenda, which is not even biblical. Are they going to be reprogrammed, retrained? And what if they're not programmable? What's going to happen to them then? Do we have perhaps some concentration camps ready for them or something to get them out of the way? However, we must think, start thinking bigger. The Great Commission is to make disciples, not just converts of the nations. Please note that it's nations, not just individuals. Those who are called to rule and reign with him must start to think much bigger. This is a mega thrust towards something which the Bible predicted. And they have a vision. This is all him speaking. So we have it straight out of a night of Malta's mouth. When I was praying this morning, I saw a large ball of fire come out of heaven. It came right at me, and I knew that there was no way I could avoid it, so I didn't even try it. It hit me right in the chest. I was then shown the most beautiful bridal dress I had ever seen. It was truly from out of this world, supernaturally beautiful. Then the voice of the Lord came to me and said, Help my bride put on this dress. Who's the bride here? The church, which church? Roman Catholicism and the reformers had labeled it Antichrist. But the Counter-Reformation had taken off the heat and today we believe the Jesuit counter-theology. And we have another Antichrist who's a pie in the sky who will come at some stage long after the coming of Christ is already there. Too late, gentlemen and ladies. The church is about to be clothed with beauty that is beyond this world. She's going to make herself ready and become the glorious bride of our Lord deserves. Help her. Help her. And then they start the movements, the call. Nashville. Note the date. 777. Numerical Issues are very important to these people. Expect prophetic proclamations that will begin to shake the, this nation for good. I'll see you there. I believe that 777 will be a pivotal date in the history of our nation. I'm calling all who will to join us for this strategic event to come to the call at Titan Stadium in Nashville, Tennessee. There we will pray fast, call out together for the turning of our great nation. Destiny, destiny is on this event. So there's fear on the one side. We are losing our power. We are losing our economic power. We are losing our religious cohesion. We have sinned and the nation has to come back. And then there is the fear of Islam on the other hand. And maybe a different system other than what we are used to. Let's get this nation to come together and take control. And here is the official web page of the call. The purpose of the call was for the church to renew her marital covenant with the Lord, to repent for a toleration of Jezebel, and to pray for a new Jesus, Jesus movement to sweep the nation. And millions of people throughout the world are excited about this great event. The call was a gathering that took place in Nashville, and we've read that as shown in the picture here. It was a powerful time of worship to the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as fasting and prayer for our nation of America. Over 70,000 people filled the football stadium between 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. in this unique 777 date. Mostly young adults filled the area on the field, and this event seemed geared towards the young adult generation around ages 16 to 25. 
From the stage, both older and younger adults offer testimonies and prayers of repentance for the sins of their generation. The main topics of repentance included abortion, sex outside of the marriage, homosexuality, all of these issues. Is there something wrong with repenting from these sins? Of course not. This is the sad thing. There's nothing wrong with repenting from sin. But the greater part about this event was the intensity of the people worshipping through music, which kept the place very energized. It was tremendous to have tens of thousands of people with uplifted hand in worship and jumping and dancing for King Jesus. Several different groups of musicians with many different music styles were sharing the platform. When you hear the sound of this, will you all bow down? Don't we read that in the book of Daniel? Will music be a snare in the end of time? And if you have all kinds of music, well, then you can have all kinds of reactions. Music should be sweet, worshipful, and it should be reverent and harmonious. But here is a different mindset. There were also three different couples who were actually married right there in the stadium. And the unique date, July 7, 7, saw the most marriages of any day in history. Marriage is about the true covenant and people were encouraged to renew their covenant to vows to the Lord Jesus during this time. Also the number seven actually means covenant in Hebrew. So there's an interesting development over here. And then they march through the streets. Is this a movement that is mega? Yes or no? It is. The call exactly 40 years after the rebellion of the 1967 hippie movement. Who was behind that movement, by the way? Wasn't it the Jesuits? Wasn't it the Jesuit priests of Georgetown University, the very ones who were the tutors of Bill Clinton and previous presidents in the United States of America? So you start a movement to introduce a morality, immorality, and then when chaos has set in, you start a counter movement and you move the people where you want them. Interesting, they say, the starting day of the Pentecost on May 28, 2007, there was a call to fast for 40 days before this event in Nashville. Then there was a prayer walk on that day, and they walked 2.7 miles. They crossed over 140, 40 being the number of testing while walking down Church Street. So numerology is very important to all of this. And the entire day from dawn until dusk was spent worshiping, praying, repenting, and appealing to the great judge of all men for his mercy on his people. I believe now after 40 years of trial and testing, God is allowing his bride body to enter into the promise of rest. It's interesting that the politicians were all involved. Many of the Republican candidates were involved. It was 40 years ago in the summer of 1967 when Israel retook Jerusalem during the Six-Day War. Today, 40 years later, the destiny of the true church is now shifting to combine with the destiny of the nation of Israel as we transition into the kingdom age. This is a kingdom on earth. They're setting up a new kingdom. I would rather be part of the kingdom of heaven. And that is not a physical kingdom kingdom down here with laws that will force people but it is a kingdom where God has made use of our freedom of choice to freely choose for him and to obey him and to keep his commandments not because we have to but because we love him the next great event was the call so that was the beginning. Now please note, the call was held in Detroit, and look at the date, 
11, 11. The response, a call to prayer for a nation in crisis. Through Governor Rick Perry initiate, though Governor Rick Perry initiated the response in Houston, the statewide gathering we are now doing are not affiliated with any presidential candidates. But now the political arm is allying itself with the religious arm. Now Rick Perry, of course, is out of the race, but that does not matter because behind the scenes the entire body is attached to this line of thinking. So again, there's commitment to prayer above politics, to exercising our freedoms within the system of government God has given, to raise our voices before heaven and to cry out for transformation in America. Ten evangelical power brokers behind Rick Perry's prayer rally to save America. And you have Focus on the Family, founder James Dobson involved, Family Research Council, President Perkins and Richard Land. These are mega movements taking place. And then you have Doug Stringer, the mobilizer of the New Apostolic Reformation, growing evangelical movement involved. You have the California mega church pastor, Jim Gallo, the activist involved. Gallo is chairman of, the form of, of former House Speaker Newt Gingrich's Renewing American Leadership Group. So here is a mega church state movement. And as we saw, in that previous lecture as well, these politicians came straight out. Santorum came straight out and said that he wants to distance himself publicly from the statements that Kennedy had made that church and state should be separate. And in fact, he said that statement once makes him want to throw up. Most importantly, Gallo is a close spiritual advisor to presidential candidate Newt Gingrich. He's also out of the race, but that doesn't matter. And leads Gingrich's renewing American leadership group. So Gallo is a principal advocate of Seven Mountains Dominionism. They want to take over the world. There's Alice Patterson. Patterson is founder of Justice at the Gate a San Antonio-based ministry that focuses on racial healing, repenting for racial sins and overcoming racial divides within the evangelical movement. These are all good causes. If you take any one of these causes individually, you will say, excuse me, is there something wrong with you? Do you not want to go along with us? Of course. You want to have healing of these things. But a healing that comes from outside pressure is no healing at all. A healing has to come out of the heart. And that healing can only be achieved by Jesus Christ and no one else. Tony Evans, apostle for the rainbow right, a well-known black megachurch pastor, is listed as an honorary co-chair. The response, Evans is the senior pastor for Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, Dallas, founder of the Urban Alternative. And he's also a speaker for Promise Keepers. And all of these organizations, when you trace them back, you will find the Roman Catholic roots right there. And of course, Bush was also involved. And then a massive coup for them, Samuel Rodriguez, the bridge builder, getting Rodriguez on board with a response is a coup d'etat that should have Democrats shaking in their boots as the president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference. Rodriguez is the leading spokesman for the fastest growing subset of evangelicals. So we're trying to get all these people on board. And then David Lane, Although he's officially the finance chair of the response, evangelical activist David Lane is the brains behind Rick prayer, Perry's prayer rally, according to evangelicals familiar with the response. Initially, they also used the, well, the mantra that they want to convert Islam, but they backed down from that one, and I'm interested to know why. Past the policy briefings, He's involved in all of that. And then the Right Wing Watch is an interesting webpage if you want to know about 
as citizens and how they are concerned about some of these things. And they write that the call, Detroit is closely linked to Rick Perry's radical the response rally in August, which was organized by the International House of Prayer. These are all big organizations where Engel is based. They includes many of the same speakers and it promotes seven mountains dominionism, which means taking control of every aspect that affects humanity. So that was that call. Perry's partners with founder of Seven Mountains Dominionism for prayer rally. And you have Rick Perry has tried to distance himself from the many extreme activists he's working with to put on the response rally, like the pastor who labeled Oprah Winfrey the harbinger of the Antichrist and uh, the self-proclaimed apostle who called the Statue of Liberty a demonic idol. And, but Perry is about open about his ties to advocates of Seven Mountain Dominionism. So they really want to have this kind of theological and political setup in the United States of America. Then the American Family Association is involved. Right Wing Watch claims that the response rally is linked to the American Family Association, which claims that Americans have turned away from God and must be brought back. If there is a good and strong and direct direction for the people, then we've turned away from God and our country is being attacked by seemingly all these different things at the same time. What a time in our country's history just to recognize we don't have all the answers. This is beyond us. Go to God and prayer. And Dobson, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you doing this. I'm sure Shirley does too. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands do because this is precisely what we need at this time. And the whole world being swept into this euphoria. Here's the American Family Association webpage. You can see what they're interested in. The issues are the moralic, moral, moral decay in the world today. Atheists demand crosses to be removed. These are agendas that affect every thinking Christian, making a mockery of marriage. And you wonder by yourself, why is it that presidents introduce new legislation that seems to make the moral fiber go downward in a spiral. Have you ever thought, thought of pendulum swing theology? You make it go so far in the one direction that the pendulum has to swing to the other side. And if you get the pendulum to swing to the other side and you have the momentum, you can't stop it anymore. This is where we're going. The International House of Prayer has prophecy of looming natural disasters, economic wreckage because of legal abortion. So how do you change a government that is legislating a decay in morality? The only way you can do that is to take control of the government. Then you can de-legislate. And that's what Santorum said in his campaign speeches. This is what the Supreme Court is upholding. This is what the courts in the country are upholding. We cannot go along with that. How do you change it? Take control. So then you legislate morality, and the Constitution says you cannot do that because nobody can legislate that kind of thing. Israel and the Church in the End Times, International House of Prayer. According to Right Wing Watch, the response's leadership team includes the senior staff members of the International House of Prayer, a large, highly political Pentecostal organization built on preparing participants for the return of Jesus Christ. But of course, that return is associated with the literal Israel. And we saw in the previous lecture 
that the Jews living in that area are not even the descendants of the Judeans. They come from a totally different culture. So it's not a kingdom that had disappeared and dissipated and is now being put together. It comes from a totally different people. So this is not the original Judean government system that is being restored over there. Jesus said, your house is left for you desolate. This is another ruse. It's very easy to have a theology that is bound to something that is happening out there on the stage of history. But Jesus is concerned with what is happening here in the heart. Who are you allied to? Are you allied to the world and its norms and standards? Or are you allied to him? And he never forces. He never coerces. Here's the Family Research Council. Click here to register. Diplomatic Christianity. One Israeli Arab pastor's perspective on persecution and ministry in the Holy Land. They have the same issues. Marriage, family, sexuality. But the Jerusalem culture plays a tremendous role. So you have evangelicals running in that direction. But Catholics behind the scenes knowing, no, we're actually setting up a kingdom right here. And we don't intend going anywhere. We want to rule down here. Biography, Tony Perkins, president of the Washington, D.C.-based Family Research Council, is former member of the Louisiana legislature, where he served for eight years, and he's recognized as a legislative pioneer for authoring uh, measures like the nation's first covenant marriage law. And interesting things like that. He's not in the government anymore by choice. And then the Bible speaks about something that affects the heart and the mind. Give me this mountain. The children of Judah came in unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephaniah and the Kenesite said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kardesh Barnea. Verse 7 says, Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kardesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed my God that had an opportunity to go into the promised land. But because of unbelief and rebellion, they were turned back into the wilderness. And there they wandered for 40 years. And all that had been faithful, all of them had to go back into the wilderness with them. And so every child of God is sent when he accepts the call, he is sent into the wilderness. And in the wilderness experience, we are in one way or another cut off from that, which is our former hold fast. And we have to come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's in our wilderness walk with God that we learn to understand the mindset of God, learn to know his character, learn to love him, and learn the advantages of obedience to his law. And this is what these old soldiers did. Joshua 14, verse 9, And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. What is the condition for receiving the true kingdom of God? Holy following the Lord. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 40 and 5 years. 
Even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. Eighty-five years old. As yet I am as strong in this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Is he speaking here only about a physical strength or is he speaking about a moral strength? Of course it's a moral strength. But in his case also a physical strength. If you want to find strength in the Lord, then stay faithful. And the wilderness experience, this life is your wilderness experience. And you walk this life with the Lord and you find out what his will is. Now therefore give me this mountain. This mountain is the true promised land. And we are all well able to take it. Just like Caleb. Wherefore the Lord spoke in that day, for thou heardst in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be, the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. There will be Anakims on our way. There will be issues to overcome. There will be doubts to overcome. If you want to enter into that mountain. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephaniah Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephaniah and the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Over and over, the Bible emphasizes what the conditions are for gaining access to the mountain. And the name of Hebron before was Kiryat Arba, which Arba was a great man amongst the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. Joshua 14, verse 15. We read in the Spirit of Prophecy volume, I'm as strong this day as I was in the days that Moses sent me. Now therefore give me this mountain. Before the distribution of the land had been entered upon, Caleb, accompanied by the heads of his tribe, came forward with special claim. Except Joshua, Caleb was now the oldest man in Israel. Caleb and Joshua were the only ones among the spies who had brought a good report of the land of promise, encouraging the people to go up and possess it in the name of the Lord. The others had claimed there are too many giants here. We will not be able to overcome them. Will we be able to overcome the giants of secularism in our hearts and in our minds? This is a battle for the heart. Are we going to overcome the false philosophies that are thrown at us by the world, by legislation? Caleb now reminded Joshua of the promise then made as the reward of his faithfulness. He therefore presented a request that Hebron be given him for a possession, and his claim was immediately granted. To none could the conquest of this giant stronghold be more safely entrusted. Here were giants. There are obstacles to overcome. Caleb's faith now was just what it was when his testimony had contradicted the evil report of the spies. He had believed God's promise, that he would put his people in possession of Canaan, and in this he had followed the Lord fully. So what's another condition? You have to believe God. You have to believe God. You can't believe the world and God. He had endured with his people the long wandering in the wilderness, that sharing the disappointments and burdens of the guilty. Yet he made no complaint of this, but exalted the mercy of God that had preserved him in the wilderness when his brethren were cut off. The brave old warrior was desirous of giving to the people an example that would honor God and encourage the tribes fully to subdue the land which their fathers had deemed unconquerable. Caleb obtained in the inheritance upon which his heart had been set for 40 years. 
and trusting in God to be with him, he drove thence the three sons of Anak. We need to go back to our Bibles. We need to understand what God is trying to tell us. He tried to tell us, he used the reformers to tell us, and we rejected it. We've gone back to another theology, a counter theology. The cowards and rebels had perished in the wilderness, but the righteous spies ate of the grapes of Eshkol. So if you've spied out the land, the goodly land which Jesus speaks of, you will also eat the grapes thereof. To each was given according to his faith. The unbelieving had seen their fears fulfilled. Notwithstanding God's promise, they had declared that it was impossible to inherit Canaan, and they did not possess it. If you don't claim the promises of God, you will not receive them. But those who trusted in God, looking not so much for the difficulties to be encountered as to the strength of their almighty helper, entered the goodly land. Now let's look at a contrast. The children of Joshua, they were on the other side. Spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit? Another claim concerning the division of the land revealed a spirit widely different from that of Caleb. It was presented by the children of Joseph, the tribe of Ephraim, with the half-tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh, and the consideration of their superior numbers, these tribes demanded a double portion of territory. The lot designated to them was the richest in the land, including the fertile plain of Sharon. But many of the principal towns in the valley were in possession of the Canaanites, and they were afraid. They were afraid. And the tribes shrank from the toil and danger of conquering their positions and desired an additional portion that had already been subdued. There's no easy way into Canaan. We have to overcome that which will overcome us if we don't overcome it. The tribe of Ephra, Ephraim was the, uh, one of the largest in Israel, as well as the one to which Joshua himself belonged. And its members naturally guarded themselves as entitled to special consideration. Why hast thou given me but one lot? And one portion to inherit, they said, seeing I'm a great people. But no departure from strict justice could be won from the inflexible leader. His answer was... If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country and cut down for thyselves there in the land of the parasites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. Do something. Work. Their reply showed the real cause of the complaint. They lacked faith and courage to drive out the Canaanites. The hill is not enough for us, they said. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron. Did you know that the Bible says, outside are the dogs. And then it mentions all the sinners. But then it has a fearful word there. And it lists amongst those that are outside, the fearful. The fearful. We cannot afford to be afraid of numbers. We cannot be af afford to be afraid of a loss of reputation. Either we are with Christ or we are with his enemy. And this is the big issue. This is not a battle for a physical area. This is a battle that takes place in here. But these people are fighting for a physical area which they want to control, the physical earth, and they want to legislate morality, which you cannot do. This is something that must take place in the heart. 
By contrast, Caleb, amid all the hardships, perils, and plagues of the desert wanderings and during the years of warfare since entering Canaan, the Lord had pres preserved him. And now at upwards of four score, his vigor was unabated. He did not ask for himself a land already conquered, but the place which was above all others, the spies had thought it impossible to subdue. I want this mountain. I don't want this other mountain. I don't want any of these others. I want this mountain. And I want to stand one day with Caleb, and I hope you stand with Caleb one day and take no other mountain. I want this one. And how's the road to get there? Is it broad and wide and easy, or is it a narrow road? It's the narrow road. Caleb obtained the inheritance upon which his heart had been set for 40 years and trusting in God to be with him, he drove thence the three sons of Anak. Having thus secured a possession for himself and his house, his zeal did not abate. He did not settle down to enjoy his inheritance, but pushed on to go to further conquests for the benefit of the nation and the glory of God. This shows his mindset. It wasn't an issue of self. It was an unselfish quest that he had. Cowards and rebels had perished in the wilderness, but the righteous spies ate of the grapes of Eskol. To each was given according to his faith. These are the choices we have to make in the world that we live in. And we will see that it, it's going to get worse, not better. And the only way to get to that mountain is to cling to the captain of the Lord of hosts. That's the only way. Notwithstanding God's promise, they declared that it was impossible to inherit Canaan. If you don't believe what God has promised, how can you expect to enter into Canaan? Jesus would have all who profess his name become earnest workers. It is necessary that every individual member build upon the rock Christ Jesus. Every individual member. I cannot watch the unfolding of the kingdom of God on television and say, I hope it comes soon so that I can have rest. Rest from what? Rest from immorality. Rest from feminism. Rest from fundamentalism, Islamic or otherwise. Rest from, what are you afraid of? Turmoil, economic collapse. Where do you find rest? Nobody will find rest from any of those. Rest is something that happens in here. Daniel found rest in his God in the midst of Babylon. Daniel found rest from his trials and troubles in the midst of the lion's den. Because the mouths of the lions were stopped. Why? Because it is by faith that he conquered. So don't expect yourself to be taken away from the trouble. The Bible, in fact, predicts in this world you will have, what's the word? Tribulation. All of these efforts to gain an earthly kingdom is to get rid of that which bothers you. But it's an exterior thing. We're looking for an interior thing. While the doubting ones talk of impossibilities, while they tremble at the thought of high walls and strong giants, let the faithful Caleb's who have another spirit come to the front. The truth of God, which brings salvation, will go forth to the people if ministers and professed believers will not hedge up its way, as did the unfaithful spies. We want Caleb's now who will press to the front. Let the voice of the Caleb's be heard. I believe because God said so. 
And if he said so, I don't care how big the obstacles are in my way, because if he is with me, no obstacle is too great. It is when the unbelieving cast contempt upon the word of God that the faithful Caleb's are called for. When they start telling you evolution is correct and God did not create in six days. Well, then the faithful Caleb's are called for and says, excuse me, the word of God says otherwise. It is then that they will stand firm at the post of duty without parade and without swerving because of a reproach. The unbelieving spies stood ready to destroy Caleb. Those who want to enter into the mountain of God will have opposition from every quarter, even from their own people. Did Caleb have it? Did Moses have it? Why should we be better? Did Jesus have it? Yes. As my friend once said to me, when I said to him, why are they treating you so badly? His own people. He said, my high priest has not had me stoned or flogged yet. He has a point. We have much more than we can endure. <laughs> He saw the stones in the hands of those who had brought a false report, but this did not deter him. He had a message and he would bear it. The same spirit will be manifest today by those who are true to God. I want that mountain. It is wholehearted, thoroughly decided men and women who will stand now. Christ sifted his followers again and again until at one time there remained only 11 and a few faithful women to lay the foundation for the Christian church. And God will sift us. We're on a desert road, and we are being sifted. There are those who will stand back when burdens are to be borne, but when the church is all aglow, they catch the enthusiasm, sing and shout, and become rapturous. But watch them. When the fervor is gone, only a few faithful Caleb's will come to the front and display unwavering principle. It's what happens here in the heart. What have you learned on your road with God? No man can succeed in the service of God unless his whole heart is in the work. And he counts all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Can I pick up a sword and go and fight for an earthly kingdom to be raised up when Jesus Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world, and I will come again, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again, so that you can be where I am also? Of course not. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making the service of God supreme will find perplexities vanish in a plain path before their feet. Ministry of Healing, what a wonderful book. We have to believe God's promise. If you want to take hold of the mountain of God, the true kingdom, then you have to believe him. It's not enough to have a euphoria. It's not enough to have a music concert. It's not enough to have emotional feelings. There has to be a real change in the heart. And this happens not on the public stage. It's something that happens in your inner room and changes you into a different person. Those who work for God will meet with discouragement, but the promise is always there. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. God will give a most wonderful experience to those who will say, I believe thy promise, I will not fail nor become discouraged. And that is where we have to be now because it's going to get worse on our planet. And if you're in trouble, the Savior will help you. He will send help just when you need it. Every thorn that wounds our feet has wounded his. Every cross, he has borne it. He uplifts the distressed. 
Not a sigh breathed, not a pain felt, nor a grief pierced the soul, but the throb vibrates to the Father's heart. God is bending from his throne to hear the cry of the oppressed. And then he says, here am I, here am I. We need not be afraid in this battle, but there's massive danger if we hesitate and if we doubt. As the prophet Jonah thought of the difficulties and seem, in seeming impossibilities of his commission, he was tempted to question the wisdom of the call. While he hesitated, still doubting, Satan overwhelmed him with discouragement. And he was willing to be thrown overboard and to die rather than to go and do what God told him to go and do. We must not succumb to discouragement, not now, when we see the very events that the Bible predicted would happen unfolding before us. We may not let courage fail us now. Never let your courage fail. Never talk unbelief because appearances are against you. As you work for the master, you will feel pressure for want of means, but the Lord will hear and answer your petition for help. Let your language be, the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Once this legislation is enacted, this moral legislation. Once these new ethical values are ensconced and we find ourselves at the receiving end of legislation that forces us to act contrary to the plainest dictates of God, we will come into straight places. But let not your courage fail. Keep your eyes on the mountain and keep your eyes on the promise. He said, you will walk on this land, and you will. So be hopeful, and be courageous, and don't let despondency take control of you. And you must talk hope, talk hope. When everything seems discouraging, press your way through the obstacles. You are in a spiritual wedlock with Jesus Christ. He's been there before you. Walk through that valley of darkness and exercise that faith of Caleb. It was Caleb's faith in God that gave him courage, that kept him from the fear of man, even the mighty giants, the sons of Anak, and enabled him to stand boldly and unflinchingly in defense of the right. And as these waves start rolling over God's people at the end of time, we must learn to stand irrespective of what the great men say. Do you think we will come up for ridicule? When I resigned from my university because I no longer wanted to teach evolution, do you think I came up for ridicule? Of course I came up for ridicule. A thunderbolt struck him. And he's insane. He's become insane. But God lifted me up, and I can still stand in their presence and speak the words that I now believe with more ammunition than I ever thought possible. God is faithful. He will not leave you nor forsake you and work with determination. Those in the service of God must show animation and determination in the work of winning souls. This is not a time like the others to say, this is not big enough for us, and, and those over there are too strong for us. I want to live here in peace and safety in my little hovel. I want to become a monastic. I want to build a wall around me so that nobody can touch me from the outside world. No, go out and preach the gospel. Go and warn people of where we are in the stream of time and face these difficulties bravely. Difficulties will arise that will try your faith and patience. Face them bravely. Look on the bright side. If the work is hindered, be sure that it is not your fault and then go forward rejoicing in the Lord. We're on a battle and a march. We're marching to what? Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. A real Zion not one that is made by human hands. Abraham, it tells us in the Hall of Fame, looked for a city 
whose builder and maker was God. He didn't look for an earthly city. And he looked for it like the revelator says, a bride dressed coming down out of heaven. So trial means benefit, but when the tribulation comes upon us, how many of us are like Jacob? We think it is the hand of an enemy. And we wrestle with this, with this stranger when actually we're wrestling with God. The Lord Jesus is our, our efficiency. Workers for Christ are never to think much less to speak of failure in their work. If the Lord has given us a commission, preach it, and then you can expect great things. You can expect it will happen, even if it doesn't seem like it. It is not the capabilities you now possess or ever will have that will give you success. It is that which the Lord can do for you and not what you can do in your own strength. We need to have far less confidence in what man can do and far more confidence in what God can do for every believing soul. Put your talents into the work, ask God for wisdom, and it will be given to you, and all difficulties, you will see them being removed if you seek the Lord and if you be converted every day. The battle is for the mind, but the battle is also for the heart. You know, I can know all things. I can understand all prophecy. I can understand all history. I can see how it all fits together. Is that going to save me? I can understand the commandments. I can understand the logic behind them. But if my heart is not transformed, if God doesn't give me his unction, if I do not ask for a righteousness which is outside of myself, I will not enter into the mountain of God. It is a fallacy. No, it is presumption to say we're setting up the kingdom of God. Through most wonderful workings of divine providence, mountains of difficulties will be removed and cast into the sea. Romans chapter 8 says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us? And then that beautiful eulogy of Paul. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? It is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. <laughs> Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is my call. Let us conquer the mountain that God wishes us to conquer. And let us take possession of a land that he will give us. And may the Lord help us to understand the difference between the true and the false. Amen.